less stress, more time, more money. Welcome to the Cash Flow Contractor interview. What's up? How are we doing? Doing well. We have a, our first guest on the podcast. And, you mean uh, I'm not a guest? You no, know, no, your co-host, oh. man. Oh, okay. Um, well, I thought I should be treated like royalty. Yeah, we got we got four people here today. So obviously me, Khalil, and uh, Martin, and then we've got Ethan as usual taking notes, ready for his. Uh, we're changing the segment every time, but I think it's intern insights with Ethan Dvorak, and then special guest today, Eric Daffern. Welcome, Eric. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to be how's, here. Uh, how's Tulsa? You know, with this uh, pandemic going on, everyone is is uh, quiet and uh, mm -hmm. uh, everyone's staying healthy and, and safe. That's great. Including how's, you. How's, yeah, including me. <laughs> including me. Yeah, you're uh, you're right. You live right by the river there in Tulsa. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, well, actually, I'm about two miles from the river. My okay. office is actually I can see the see the Arkansas River from my office. Nice. They've yeah. really done a good job up there. Yeah. You know, developing that area along the river. You know, it's amazing. A year ago, that whole area was flooded. And, yeah. Uh, and now we're in a little bit of a drought. So it's been an interesting you, contrast. You know, yeah. we're also fortunate we don't need to put a comma Oklahoma after Tulsa. It seems like everybody <laughs> knows where Tulsa is. So, but it is Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> it Tulsa, is. Oklahoma. It's, it's home. It's special. I like it. Well, Eric, um, excited to have you here today, and I know you've got a good story for us, but before that, I want to get a little bit of a background on who you are, where you're from, you know, uh, and how you got into what it is that you do and what it is that you do. So, yeah. Um, yeah, why don't you tell us, you know, how you got started as a construction lawyer? Well, I appreciate you guys letting me be on this uh, podcast. You know, being a contracting lawyer or a contractor lawyer or a real estate lawyer uh, has always been a passion of mine. And, and I grew up in a small town in southern Oklahoma and uh, had never been to Tulsa until I met my wife in college and, and uh, went to school at the University of Oklahoma. But probably the first idea of becoming a, a construction real estate lawyer happened when I was about 16 or 17 years old. And my father left uh, the family, and, uh, and as a result, uh, we didn't have any uh, uh, income to keep the house. Wow. And as a result, uh, uh, we lost our house in foreclosure. And that made such an impression on me that I became obsessed with real estate and construction. And I said, I'll never let that wow. happen again. And so for the last 40 years, I've been chasing that obsession and trying to help people solve construction and real estate issues. Wow. Actually, I didn't know that about you. That's, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That's really powerful. So, so, so interesting, you know, most people who go to law school, uh, go for a variety of reasons, whether it's criminal law or whether it's, uh, uh, personal injury. I went in specifically to learn as much as I could about real estate and construction. Wow. And that, that was my focus. And, and, uh, when I graduated from law school in 1989, I, uh, went to a little law firm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and married my college sweetheart, and we had two wonderful boys, and now I've got a three-year-old granddaughter, and life is perfect. And so, this wow. has been a great time. So, uh, when I when I started the the uh, uh, with the small firm here in Tulsa, it was more of a general practice firm, and I always had that itch to get out and really focus on what I want to do. And yeah. in 2000, I had that opportunity and went out and started my own practice and I've never looked back. It's been a great wow. journey. That's great. So back to when you were in law school, I mean, were you the only one that was like, Hey, I'm doing real estate and construction Were there, do you, you know, like you had classmates that were also, you know, really hot, really interested in that as well. Or were you unique in that? Well, no, I think, I think a lot of lawyers have interest in real estate. You know, you've got title lawyers, you've got, uh, Right. You got lawyers who, who want to develop, who, you know, and, and actually there's a lot of people who just didn't want to go get their MBA. So they went to law school Interesting. and they felt, they felt like that they could see life from a different perspective and it would give them different uh, skill sets. But most of them, you know, there's a lot of people who just went into business and I've got yeah, a lot of friends you. who went into to 
development and construction. And in fact, I've got a good friend who's a client who uh, uh, went to law school and and worked for a big firm in a big city for a while and came home and came and started building homes and, and he's doing great. So yeah. no, I, th- I think there's a huge interest in, in real estate. I mean, believe it or not, it's really an exciting area. There's yeah. a lot of things to do. There's a, uh, uh, everything changes every day. And so you get a lot of different uh, opportunities to help people and, and it's just a great life. Excellent. So, so tell us, um, What's it like, you know, you obviously are, you, you've already said you're focused on construction, real estate. What are some of the typical things you're working on for clients? Well, primarily what, what we do and, and, and what we focus on, and, and I guess a better way to say it would be what our philosophy is, is we want to try to educate contractors, um, owners, real estate owners, real estate investors. We want to educate them in ways that they can improve their business, improve their real estate. And, and I tell everybody, you know, there's a lot of risks in being a, a contractor or a builder or even a property owner. But if you, if you took all of the risks out there, you could probably put them under two umbrellas. And one would be the risk of getting sued. And the other one would be the risk of getting, of not getting paid. And so the focus of our practice has really been on trying to help uh, people in the real estate industry to, to avoid getting sued and, and to uh, collect as much money as they can. And, uh, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. We, we like to do it through education. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes things don't work out and people end up in court. And so we also represent people in, uh, in litigation as well. But I think, I think the primary focus of our practice is try to help people before they get into trouble. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So I think what a good segue is, because I, I want to get into your story, um, but describe like your typical client for us. Like, who are they? What's their average day like? What are they, What kind of work are they doing? Size, those kinds of things. Well, that's a tough one. Try, trying to trying, to, <laughs> trying to, to say what would be the the, the typical client, and, and that's the beauty of this of this business is is that there's so many people involved in real estate that it's uh, it, it's it's really a a great mix, um, right, of of clients. But I, I guess I would have to say that that the typical client would be a construction owner, uh, someone who has. Uh, been in the business for 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Or it may be, it may, it may be that, that young man or woman who just got out of uh, tech school, who's wanting to start a new business, whether it's an electrical contractor or a plumber. Right. Um, uh, it, it can also be a, a husband and wife who's looking to buy a home. And, sure. um, you know, it, it was interesting. I had a, I had someone ask me once uh, whether I represent builders or owners or, or who I represent. And I thought about it for a minute for a minute. And I said, well, I try to represent whoever's right. And so, <laughs> so, so I, so I represent everybody, you know, we look at their situation and we're trying to find resolution. We're trying to find solutions for them. And so it, it's, it's uh, it's a real good mix. Okay. Good. You job. know, Eric, and just jumping in real quickly, uh, we're kind of talking about real estate and construction law and the two are intertwined is most construction law partly related to real estate or are they different disciplines? Well, the, ultimately it's, it's, it, it involves dirt. I mean, okay. I, you know, I, I go from that perspective that, that real estate and construction basically involve dirt and, okay. and a good friend of mine refers to himself as a dirt lawyer. And, <laughs> and, and so ultimately, so do a lot of other people. If it's, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so, so it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's very similar in that ultimately you're you're trying to deal with if it's in the construction area you're building on dirt everything okay. from the ground up uh, if it's if it's in the dirt you're dealing with titles you're dealing with with uh, easements you're dealing with all kinds of different things so so really really uh, it's it's intertwined and it's it's, it's such yeah. a complementary uh, area of the law okay gotcha. You know, just before we go real quick and do your story too, you said something earlier that uh, really resonated with me. Um, 
you like you tried to prevent the issues and it's true in contracting and manufacturing any other operational the earlier you find a problem the cheaper the resolution is yeah, yeah absolutely like before you build the building and don't get paid or do you find out you're not going to get paid before you sign a contract anyway that's exactly i thought that's right. a major league major league point you know where where i got that idea and and cleo you're probably a little young for this but martin probably remember this because he's closer <laughs> to my age but back in the 70s there was a commercial by fram auto filter i don't know if you remember that oh i remember but, that yeah, yeah but orange but, but one of the, yeah but one of their commercials was there was a there was a mechanic sitting there holding a uh, an oil filter and behind him was it was an old car with a with the with the hood up and and you could tell he was he was replacing the engine and their tagline was you can either pay me now or you can pay me later and and the idea was you can pay me five dollars for this filter to keep your car running good or you can pay me on the backside when i have to uh, replace your engine and right. so ever since then i thought you know what it's really easier to keep a company healthy before they get into trouble because once yeah. they once they get into trouble and you have to spend a lot of money with lawyers and and go to litigation it becomes an extremely extremely expensive proposition it's one of the most stressful things you'll ever have to deal with so that's the reason I've, I've really focused on trying to help clients solve problems before they ever get there. Well, and I'm excited to talk today because I think for a lot of people, myself included, honestly, but for a lot of contractors, it's it's a bald spot. You know, you can't see it. You don't know that it's a problem. You don't know that you could just pay the five dollars now and not have to replace the engine, or you know, work with someone like you right now, <clears throat> and you know, pay some money but avoid you know, losing out on hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, if, if you get into a, into a tricky situation. So, mm -hmm. um, and that, I think that's kind of like your story. You said, um, you know, there's, there was a, a client of yours that almost got into one of those situations, right? Well, yeah, yeah. We, we deal with this all the time. In fact, and, 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 and I'll tell you a quick story real quick. You know, my wife is a builder also, and she's a right. general contractor. And, and so, uh, uh we have a construction company that, that that gives me the opportunity to see it from boots on the ground and to see right. really what some of the risks are. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. We had a client recently that we uh, worked with and, and, you know, you usually deal with lawyers when, when things, and just like you said, when, when things seem to go wrong, you try to go in and get a lawyer to help you solve that problem. We had a client recently in, in a, in a, when it was, Everything was perfect, and and there was no reason to think that anything would go wrong. And uh, uh, this client had a a job to to do some construction on a commercial building, and uh, it was a perfect job. It was a dream job. My client brought the job in on time, on budget, with a happy customer. Everything went perfect, and then we get down to the final payment, and that's when this pandemic hit. And as a result of that, everybody shut down and my client didn't get paid. Now, that's a perfect example of when everything goes right, it can also go suddenly wrong. And if you don't have everything in place and you don't, and you don't have your systems in place, then it can really, really upset the cart. So that's the reason you try to focus on helping people get their systems in place before we ever do anything. Well, how did that, so, how did that wind up? Did, well, that's what we're going to talk about at the end, Martin. Oh, okay. We got to leave you hanging. Oh, you got me, man. You hooked me. <laughs> <laughs> you got to wait till the end. You're ruining it. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. So that, I think that's a, I mean, so we want to talk with you about some of those failures, you know, mm -hmm. that some of these risks that these contractors aren't aware of and the failures that they have in place right now that they need to actually fix. And maybe if they can take some advice from, from you, uh, get these things sorted out now before it becomes a bad situation. Um, so I know we talked about this before, but you, you had mentioned that one of the biggest failures you see in contractors is that they have zero systems or little to no systems. Um, so why do why are systems so important to contractors? Well, <clears throat> the, the reason that systems are so important to contractors is, I mean, and think about it. Why does a craftsman go into business? Because he loves his craft. And, and most of the, the, the tradesmen out there, most of the builders 
are great craftsmen and they're, right. they're good at what they do, but sometimes they don't have the systems in place to, to run their business. And so a lot of times I ask my client, do you want to be, say, for example, I've got a, a plumbing client. I, I, I ask him, I said, do you want to be a plumber or do you want to be in the business of plumbing? And that, and, and that's a, it's a real shift in perception mm. about how you want to run your business. Do you want to just be a plumber or, or you just make a, a, a you know, a, a reasonable living, or do you want to be in the business of plumbing and really take it to the next level? And so what we focus on is helping them build that business and those systems within those buildings. I mean, within that, uh, that business. And, and so we, we find that a lot of contractors want to focus just on the craft. And so if we can help them come in and work on their systems now, now, now let me back up just a minute. When I'm talking about systems, I'm not just talking about having lawyers on your team. You know, we think that right. uh, it should, it should be, be a, a business with, with a, with a very organic um, set of systems. For example, I recommend to every client that, that they have a, a team around them, uh, a team of uh, lawyers, a team of accountants, a team of business relationships, um, uh, a, a relationship with your insurance agent, because that's what they do. They're there to help protect you. And if you can get on board with them and, and get them part of your team, then they're going to help you create those systems that's going to protect you in the long run. Absolutely. I think those trusted advisors are huge. And Martin, you talk a lot about that. Um, just, you know, you don't have to be the expert in a specific field. Like you don't need to go and get a law degree just because you're a general contractor or a subcontractor, right? Well, you're, you're not going to do those things <laughs> in a lifetime becoming an attorney, another lifetime becoming a good attorney, but where you can also become a banker and become a CPA become an IT expert and become an HR expert. You're not going to do all those things. It does take a team. And Eric, uh, you know, that you're singing my song right there. Um, people, I think, well, why do people not do that? It doesn't take, it's, it's so logical. I've never had anybody push back and say that, um, oh no, I don't need a team. Why, why is it? Uh, well, I'll make it a little bit specific in general. Why do they not have a team of advisors in specific? I've worked with easily over a hundred contractors of every sort and maybe two of them have a relationship with an attorney. Why is that in your estimation? Well, well I, th I think there's a, there's several reasons, but I think, I think the main reason is, is uh, the cost. I mean, there's no question that, that lawyers are expensive right. and, and anytime Especially a good you go, one. Yeah. And, and, and believe me, I, I'm the first to tell you the two things I hate doing, uh, well, I'll tell you the main thing I hate doing is paying lawyers. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, when, when, when we get out of, for example, in our construction company, if we get out of an area that I'm not familiar with, then sometimes I'll bring in an expert. And when I have to write that check to that lawyer, I see how much he charges per hour. And, and quite frankly, I don't like to pay it. So, so it's very understandable that, that a lot of people don't like paying lawyers. And so it, it's, it's kind of like paying taxes, I guess. You, you do it when you have to, but you don't like doing it. And so, so that's, I think that's the biggest thing, but the way I explain it to my clients is look, you're a craftsman and, and say, for example, you're an electrician, you have thousands of dollars worth of tools in your shop and those tools help you make money. If you will focus on a team around you and invest in your team, then you can have that team help you make money. As well, so so it, it's no different than having a, a screwdriver, a hammer, or whatever in your craft, and having a, a a lawyer, an accountant, a banker, or someone to help you on the business side of it. And it's just an investment in your business, right? Yeah, yeah I think personally that there's another uh, block because I've had it myself when I had a contracting business. Was it kind of really never occurred to me, you know? it kind of never occurred to me that I needed an attorney and mm -hmm. uh, I'm old enough now that I know better, but also after meeting you and what you'll be talking about today, I thought, yeah, I need an attorney and it can be done reasonably. And then when you'll talk about your systems, you'll see that, that they can become a little bit accomplished themselves. They don't need an attorney for everything. I mean, yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly right. 
Well, I think at the other end of it, you know, most contractors are used to doing things themselves. I mean, that's yeah. basically how they got into business and become that craftsman is because they wanted to learn. But I think also it can be intimidating. I know that I'm, I mean, I'm pretty intimidated by lawyers. Um, I don't want to get sued. I don't want to get into a, a nasty situation, not just because mm-hmm. of the cost, but because it's hard to understand, you know, yep. it's not, you can look at that, you know, all those terms in a contract and it can just be overwhelming. Um, and so I think that's another hard thing when you don't understand something, you, it's easier just to put it off and to not think about it. And that's really not the best, the best way to handle it. I mean, you're exactly right. And, and the reality is that 99% of the time, everything's going to work out. And it's right. that one, that's that one time where you get into a bind and you get pulled into a lawsuit and you spend a, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get out of this lawsuit that that can really uh, have a major impact on your business. And so, so I think that's another reason that most people don't use lawyers is simply because uh, they just don't need one most of the time. I'll be honest with you, but it's that one time that, that when the bottom falls out and you don't have any systems in place, that's, that's, you know, that's when you go to a lawyer. And so what we do is try to say, well, let's spend a little bit of money now and invest in your business. So when that one time happens, that you have a safety net under you that'll make sure that you're, that you come out on the other side. Okay. Right. You know, Eric, so, you, uh, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, Khalil. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead I was going to say you, you, we've been kind of talking in general. Uh, you mentioned two major risks, uh, not getting paid and getting sued. Did I, I got that right. Right. That's exactly okay. right. Can you, I mean, how do you approach that with a new client? Maybe they don't have a problem, uh, but they're building a big contract something new, they come to you and say, uh, I need to pay attention to the law, the legal side of my business. How, what would you talk to a new client about? I mean, if they didn't come in with a lawsuit, just they're, they're starting to worry about it. They've got some assets. They're starting to think about it. What do you, what do you talk to them about? Well, first of all, I talk to them about tools that they can use. And, and I think one of the greatest tools that any contractor can, can use is a good contract system. And, and one of the best ways to make sure you get paid and stay out of court is to have that ironclad contract put together that both sides understand and both, sti- both sides agree to and that both sides understand that there's no ambiguities. So if the bottom does fall out, everybody knows what's going to happen. And so I, I, think, I think having that contract in place is, is probably, in, in my opinion, the most important thing that a contractor can have. Okay, you and said so, contract system, right? What? And, and and what I mean by that, uh, Martin, is is you know, of course, it depends if you're a general contractor, and whether you're a supplier, whether you're a subcontractor, because you have to understand, everyone in in construction plays a role, and and a contractor plays one role because he has a contract directly with the owner. Subcontractor has a different role because he doesn't have a contract with the owner. But his contract is with the gen- general contractor. You may have sub-tier subcontractors. Then you have suppliers who have different contracts with different people. And so you've got multiple roles that you have to protect. So, for example, if you are a subcontractor um, and you're looking at a, a contract from a general contractor, that general contractor may give you a 40-page contract to look at and sign. And, um, and, and believe me, that contractor has spent tens of thousand dollars with a lawyer to prepare a, a, an extremely comprehensive contract for that subcontractor. And believe it or not, there's a lot of subcontractors that don't even read those. In fact, I had, oh, I, I had I dinner, believe you. <laughs> yeah, I had dinner with a, with a, um, uh, uh, CEO or a president of a, of a large contracting company. We were just talking about contracts. And one of the things he said, he said, you know, when we have these contracts and we give them out to subcontractors and they just sign them, he said, I know they don't read them. He said, because I wouldn't even sign my own contract. And so, <laughs> so a, lo- a, a lot of these general contractors will expect you to negotiate a little bit with them and, and, and make sure because what you want to do is have a, have a fair contract between the parties. And that involves a negotiation between the two. And yeah. so, so it's important for everybody to read their, their contracts. So one thing we do with our subcontracting clients is that we prepare an addendum. And with that addendum, we go through and we... What's an addendum? 
it, it, it's simply a document that you can attach to the main contract that outlines additional terms or terms that change the original contract. Gotcha. One so thing, rather so than thing. going in and changing the contract, you can just add to it and it one, kind of... That, that's exactly right. Because one thing that I tell people is never redline a contract because people don't like their their document to be messed up. I mean, it just to me, it just shuts everybody down. Gotcha. My, my preference would be to do an addendum where you set out all of the issues that you want to to, to deal with. And, and what we do with our clients is we go through and help them identify in each contract, those major areas where they want to discuss. And then we create an addendum for them and, and uh, they can then take that back to the contractor. And that can be a source of negotiation and coming up with a, con a contract that's uh, that's fair and equitable. So, the so same basically thing if I have an addendum, I'm a, I'm a subcontractor and I get this 40 page contract from a GC I can, rather than spend all this time reading through those 40 pages, figuring out what I like and don't like, I have this addendum from you that basically has like the 10 key points that I'm really concerned about. And then we can just talk about those 10 points with the that's contractor. A, that, that's exactly right. Gotcha. And, and, and what I tell my clients is if we can get in front of the general contractor and we go, go over these in a reasonable manner, you know, there's a lot of times that a general contractor will say, oh, okay, yeah, that's fair. Let's go ahead and change that. So, so it, it really becomes a, a, a win-win for both the general contractor and the subcontractor. Now, for example, if we represent a contractor, I'm going to be the one that writes the 40, 40 page contract. Okay. <laughs> so, and so, so, so my con my general contracting clients have a different interest in protecting different interest in their business. Now, again, whenever we come back and, and, and uh, negotiate, what we want to do is come up with something fair. And, and that's really the bottom line is to have fair terms that, that, that protect both sides. And likewise, whenever I represent an owner, you know, we've, we've got to do our best to help create standardized provisions that will protect the owner as well. And, and, and that's really, a, you know, getting down to, to what, what we do, we try to standardize everything. And that's simply in a system. Um, and by creating a system that we do something over and over and over consistently so that everybody uh, has a better chance to come out in a fair situation. Hey, Eric, you said the guy, you, the CEO you were having dinner with was commenting that I, he wouldn't sign his own contract. What's the, if you have a feel for it, what's the general acceptance by GCs of a sub wanting to negotiate? Because I know a lot of people are scared of that. They think, well, I got this big job. I mean, I'm thinking of the smaller subs here. Mm -hmm. I got this big job and, oh, man, it's really great. And those guys are huge. I, I'm not going to name any, but some, you know, sky, mm -hmm. skyscraper type construction mm -hmm. general contractors. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, who am I to talk to them? What, what are your, what's your well, experience? Are they willing to listen? Can you talk to them? Yeah. Yeah my, yeah. my experience is that most general contractors are extremely fair and equitable companies. Okay. And they want to do the right thing because, you know, you have to understand a contractor becomes successful because of his relationship with his subcontractors. Right. Okay. So the subcontractor is what is necessary for that contractor to become profitable. Well, the flip side of that is, is the same. The subcontractor needs the contractor to be, to be successful. And, and so that's the reason we go in and try to create a win-win situation for both of them. And, 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 I, and I want to clarify something. When I mentioned that I, this president that I had dinner with, he wasn't suggesting that, that, that he was trying to take advantage of, of any subcontractor. He was just simply saying that, that they have created a document which they, are, which they have created to try to protect their interest, not to take advantage of anybody. So it wasn't that he wouldn't sign it because he's trying to take advantage of anybody. Oh, no, I Simply think I understand that. It, it gives yeah. them maximum flexibility if, if they don't get, you know, pay if yeah. paid and all that stuff. Yeah. But, but back, but back to your question of, of, you know, what's the likelihood of a GC negotiating a contract? And, and I guess what I tell my clients is, well, there's, there's no chance of them negotiating if you don't ask them. Right. And the worst that they can do by asking them is simply say no. But my experience is that, that, and especially in Tulsa, we've got a bunch of great, great general contractors, 
great people and, and everyone that I've dealt with in, in this part of Oklahoma, they've been extremely fair with subcontractors. And, and likewise, well, I, we've got a lot of great subcontractors that, that, that simply want to be fair with the, with the GCs. And so we have great success in, in working with GCs and subcontractors. You know, on this idea of the, this being one of the main things, and I think this boils down to uh, not getting paid, right? I mean, that's right. kind of the, well, uh, well, and, and the, and the well, beauty of, uh, well, well, the, 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 the beauty of, of the contract is it's the tool that I recommend to use to manage both of those risks, the risk of not getting paid and the risk of getting sued. Oh, okay. So, you can, so, so, you, so that to me, that's the greatest tool that you have in dealing with both of those issues. Well, would, would, uh, do you have processes and systems and anytime a guy gets a contract, is he going to send it to his attorney or to Eric Daffern? Or is there a way he can look at it and kind of evaluate it himself without becoming a full blown lawyer? Well, and, 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 yeah, and, yeah. And, and first of all, I, I would say I would never recommend anyone practice law on their own. But, uh, but one thing that I, that I do encourage people to do subcontractors, suppliers, owners, subcontractors, is to become familiar with the main provisions and contracts okay. that usually give rise to conflict. So for example, a, the, how you're going to get paid. Uh, to me, that is one of the, the issues that we always deal with is that we want to get real clear on how someone's going to get paid. You know, is it going to be a pay if paid clause, which means that the owner doesn't, I mean, the general contractor doesn't pay the subcontractor until it's paid by the owner. Or is it a net 30 term? And so what we do is we go through and, and help identify, you know, the 10 or 15 main issues that you see in most contracts. And then what we do is try to standardize that issue or standardize uh, those, those issues into a document, usually an addendum, that they can use to help them identify it. In fact, what we do is that we, we've created a checklist that, that our clients can take and they can actually set it down next to the contract. And as a reading, if they see, oh, yep, there's where payments is, uh, the, all the terms about payment, they can check that off the checklist. And they can see how many of the issues that we've identified that they can identify in the contract. And so that's just a good tool for that they can use. Um, uh, you know, in, I, in, I don't in, think I've ever seen anything like that. <laughs> that I, mean, I think that's brilliant. And they're not going to practice law and they're not going to go, maybe even negotiate it, but they can at least know what to look at. Cause I know when I read contracts as a contractor, uh, naively, I suppose, but I always thought a contractor meant a contract meant something other than what it said because aforementioned and prior to's and all this kind of stuff. I just thought, can a yeah. layman understand that? But checklist well, idea, it, brilliant. Yeah. And the, and the checklist, like I said, after you read enough contracts, you, you start seeing these things <laughs> pop out at you. And so, like I said, we, you know, there's, there's, believe it or not, contracts are simple and it's just people trying to come to agreements about things that could go wrong. And once you come to an idea of what those are, then you can then create a checklist or an addendum to help address each of those issues. So you, you mentioned systems and we, I know we just spoke a lot about the contract systems, the addendums you know, trying to get predictable results in your, in your contracts. What are some of the other things, um, that, you know, if systems are so important, I know it's not just contracts. What are some other things you, you see the need for systems with? Well, I, you know, when it comes to systems, I think, and, and of course this is where, you know, Martin can probably speak a lot to this because of his, of his, uh, coaching is that he helps companies create systems. And I think every business, whether it's a, uh, construction client, whether it's a gas station, whether it's a clothing store, whether it's a restaurant, everyone needs to have system systems in their business. And when I, and, and, and let me explain to you what I mean by systems. A system can be very simple. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. All that a system is, is simply a, a way of doing something over and over and over and over to get a consistent result. So for example, if you have a contract and you have a checklist, you know that you're going to have consistent results if you can identify right. all of those issues. Now, I got this idea, and, and this isn't anything new, but but if you ever look at, at pilots, when they go mm -hmm. through their, their pre-flight checklist, they have, I mean, a simple checklist that they go through, 
every single time. Now, I guarantee you that most of those pilots have, have thousands of hours in the, in the sky. So why do they go back to a simple checklist? Well, because it creates a consistency, a consistency of results. So if they have that, that checklist, they can make sure that they hit each item to make sure that it's taken care of, that everyone's safe, that they can go up and not forget something. If, they, if, if a pilot forgets something, you know, it can have catastrophic effects. So, so they have a checklist every single time they take off. And to me, that's a perfect example of what a system is because it allows consistent results over and over and over. Yeah. Now, now in, 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 in construction or in any business, I think, again, I go back to my team members. You know, you need to have a good, a good lawyer. You need to have a good banker. <clears throat> you need to have a good insurance agent. You need to have a uh, uh, CPA, you know, good, a good CPA uh, as part of your team to help you create those systems. And, and, and that way you get consistency over and over. And right. as a result, with that consistency, you get better results. So I think, you know, for a lot of contractors, uh, especially subs, you know, they, they know what they do. They have a system. It's just not written down, right? They're doing it in their head, right? Is that what you see, Eric? Well, to me, I call that a handshake. And, and, <laughs> okay. And, 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 that's, and that's the problem is that, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you could do work on a handshake. Well, as, as life become, has become more complicated and more, more uh, involved, I, I guess would be a word, that you can't do that anymore. And you, you have to have something written down to make sure that, that you remember what you have to do consistently. Now, I'll give you a, an example. I had a client who, who had a, um, a team member uh, in the office who had worked there for about 20 years and did a great job in creating um, systems. The problem was she didn't write anything down. And as a result, she had everything in her, in her head. Well, after 20 years, she retired. And, and, and when she retired and walked out that door, every system went with her because there was nothing written down. And, and so, so it's important to have it down. And, and in fact, what I recommend to my clients, have a three ring binder. I mean, this doesn't have to be exotic. It doesn't have to be, be right. complicated. Just have a three ring binder and just write every process down. Now, the beauty of that is if you, if you write it down uh, and you make your team members follow that, that's, there's where you're going to get the consistency because a good written system is not dependent on interpretation and it's not dependent on personalities. So the beauty is that if that team member leaves, you can put a new team member in that place. And then so long as they follow that written system, they're going to get consistent results. And to me, that's the beauty of the system. Yep. That's great. I think another thing, you know, I don't a lot of contractors unless a lot of them are still working in the business a lot, you know, and they're not working on it. And I think sitting down to write something is not going to be their strong suit. But now we've all got these cameras in our pocket mm -hmm. and we can do a video of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So if it's if it's how you caulk something or if it's how you, you know, sand something down or paint something, whatever it is, you can just take a video of it and then you can put that in a Google drive. You can share it on a shared folder, whatever it is, and then have someone in the office, write it down, have someone else do it for you. Cause you know, I know that for some people that's daunting. I'm not going to sit down and get a three ring binder and do all this stuff, but you can just, you can take the video and do the training that way and then have someone write it out. Um, I mean, and, and you're exactly right. I've got a client who is a, um, a, a brick Mason and what he does, you know, and, and, and when you put brick up on a wall, you have these brick ties, that are attached to the wall that you put in between the bricks to make sure that the bricks stay up against the wall and don't fall right. over. And the problem is, is if, if, if they fail to put those brick ties up, then that, then that uh, brick wall can fall over. So my client, what he does is whenever they, they put these brick ties up on the wall before they put the brick up, he'll take his phone out and he'll shoot a couple pictures, drop, drop it down into a file and then forget about it. So if a, client or a customer ever comes in and says, well, wait a minute, we're having cracks here. And it may be because you didn't put brick ties up. He said, nope. My system is that I take pictures of everything. And here's the picture of your wall. 
and here's all the brick ties. And that's a beautiful system because it's simple and he can use technology and, it, and you're right. It doesn't have to be written, but when I say it has to be written, written down, I mean, it has to be documented some way. Right. Sure absolutely. Consistency. Well, I think there's value in the written aspect too. Eventually you, I think it does need to be in some sort of manual format. That's mm-hmm. really easy to follow through. And we, we talked about this before Martin, but it adds value to your business too. Right. Um, when you go to sell your business, if you have systems, you're a lot more valuable than if you don't, right? Well, I describe it as a system-dependent business rather than a people-dependent business, which is what you said, Eric. But if you ever want to sell your business, uh, the presumption is you're leaving. And if it's all in your head, your business is worth – and I could give you stories on that. I won't do it today, but it costs people millions of dollars for lack of systems. Yeah. So, well, Absolutely. Eric, you know, uh, that master contract, the checklist, I mean, is is exactly a perfect example of a system, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that is a system. Follow this might be nuanced to it to get better and so on. But is there another one that, that <clears throat> in, in construction law that makes it kind of a easily described system? You know, what, uh, another system that that's extremely valuable uh, for contractors is a mechanic lien system. And, and the reason that becomes what's a, what's a mechanic lien? Okay, so so a mechanic lien is what I call a superpower for contractors, suppliers, and subcontractors. And what I mean by that is that a, a contractor or a subcontractor or a supplier who goes in and improves real property, when I say real property, just, I mean property, it goes in and improves property, and is not paid for the work or the materials that they've used to improve that property, then they can file a mechanic lien against the property. And then they can go into court. They can prove to a judge that they're entitled to the money. And then the judge can order that the property be sold to pay the, the amount owed to the contractor. Now, to me, there's very few industries out there that have that power to force somebody to sell their property to pay the bill that's owed to them. And that's the reason I call it a superpower. So that, that's really what a mechanic lien is. So what we do is that we create mechanic lien systems around that right that, that a contractor or a subcontractor or a supplier has. And we systemize it, we write it down, and we help them understand uh, uh, what the process is to go through there. And, and in Oklahoma, it's, it's extremely simple compared to some other states, but yet it's complicated in that it's, it's, it has a lot of rules that you have to follow. And so what we try to do, again, is to create a system that creates consistency over time so that they can make sure that they can collect their money. Yeah, and there's uh, one of those rules is timing, right? So you can oh, miss your date, you can realize you're not going to get paid, and it's three days late, and you're out of luck. Absolutely, yeah. So, 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 and I'll just give an example. For in in our system, which we've used for years, you know, consists of five simple parts. And number one is to determine whether you're entitled to a mechanic lien, because not all people are entitled to mechanic liens. You have to determine. And make sure that your work is leanable. Uh, right. Number two, you have to uh, you have to uh, get the accurate and relevant information. For example, when was the last day of work? Because you're right, you have a certain time limit, and the time limits are different from from a contractor and a subcontractor. So you have to make sure you get the relevant information and accurate information. And you have to fill out the pre lien notices if it's if it's applicable and and we won't get into that right now but but then then you have to prepare the lien statements and you have to file it in the correct location and then you have to file your your lawsuit within a certain time after that so so while Oklahoma has a simple system, it does have rules that you need to follow and you can systemize that and assign a team member to make sure that that system is followed and by having one team member, you have someone to hold accountable if it's not done correctly. Yeah, I can see that being an issue if you're not one, if you don't know whose responsibility it is and it's kind of just a general thing that you do, then someone's going to think, oh, well, they did it. And then the other person's saying, well, they did it. Yep, but that's exactly yeah. right. Well, so, you know, you mentioned something because you said in Oklahoma and we're all sitting in Oklahoma at this time. Are there mechanic cleans in every state? Yeah, all United 50 states, states have mechanic, uh, mechanic lien laws. That's great. Okay, but the and, 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 exact procedures might be different, but the fact that you can create a system and track them and not miss dates and put things on calendars, uh, absolutely. you can do that everywhere. <clears throat> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that that's really important. So 
the normal contractor, I can't, how many, what percentage of contractors do you think are, you know, up to date on their mechanic lien systems? If you had to guess. If he didn't guess, oh, gosh. I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that that that's, that's that's such a tough question. I know that that any contractor that steps through our door, that's one of the first questions we ask them is, "Do you have a mechanic lien system?" And, and what's the answer? Well, and most of them will say yes, but that mechanic lien <laughs> system may be that they just remember on the on the eighty ninth day to file that <laughs> subcontractor's mechanic lien, uh, and they have to do it by the ninetieth day. So so a lot of them are not not uh, real uh, detailed. So one of the things, and again, it's all about systems. So what we did is right. we created a survey that they can um, take a simple survey. We have it on our website and I encourage them to go over and just, it's free to go over and, 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 and take a look at this, at this survey and fill it out and they can see where gaps are in their survey and in, in their mechanic lien system. And so whenever we have a client come in and, and we start talking about mechanic liens and it's a new client, We'll, we'll have them take this survey and and fill it out. And that helps us identify where the gaps are in their mechanic lien system. And then we can help them fill that gap and create a better safety net. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay. So we've talked about contract systems. We talked about systems in general, uh, mechanic lien systems. You mentioned uh, accountants. I mean, Martin, you're big on bookkeeping systems. And that, Eric, that's something that you help people at least become aware of, right? Well, what we try to do is educate them about what systems they need in their, in their business. We don't help them with any accounting I and mean, we're not. We're sure, not sure. Areas, but, but, right. uh, but, but for example, one, one area that, 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 that most contractors, well, any business really needs to focus on also uh, is the hiring and firing, the HR aspect of their business. Because the, the, the team members within a company uh, is what makes that company successful. And you need to make sure you have good um, HR uh, uh, systems in place to make sure that everyone's treated fairly. Yeah. That you get good, consistent results and, uh, and, and, and be the best company that you can be to take care of your employees. So that's it. So it's so always recommend that a, that a, you know, to that, business- to that point, Eric, uh, I believe there's some research out there. Uh, the number one reason people leave an employment and a position is unclear expectations. Um, that's why hmm. office politics are so bad because you don't know who you're supposed to line with, or you get a boss who's do this. And then the next day, why the hell did you do that? And one of the things that systems do is it defines the expectations against which people mm-hmm. are measured and they can go do those things. So, mm-hmm. HR is a, is a huge part of it. The people are so important, but the systems defend the people and enable Absolutely. them to do, to do much better. It's not just all about protecting us as the owners. Well, it's, it's just like I said earlier, a system takes out the personality. Right. Take the you. personality out of the system and you just follow the system and it is what it is. Yeah. And that way everyone's treated the same fairly consistently over time. You know, and, and, and another system that I think is, you know, let me back up. I'll give you a, a good example of how, you know, I, I keep beating this drum that you should have a lawyer, insurance agent, banker, and CPA. Uh, I've got a business coach. Well, and, and, and business coach. That's where you that's start, and then one. he yeah. to go get a lawyer and a CPA and a business. Anyway, <laughs> go, go ahead. We'll but, cut and, that and, part and a business coach. And a business coach. Um, you, know, you know, for example, I've got several clients who – who I work closely with their insurance agents to make sure that they, from a legal standpoint, that they have the correct coverage. I'm not an insurance expert. I've read a lot of insurance policies, but I rely on that, on that insurance professional to work with us, to help get the best coverage for my client, to, to fill any gaps in their insurance. And so, so I work closely with the other team members to make sure that this client is protected. And I think that that's the beauty of having the, the team mentality is that you all work together for one common good and that's for your client. Yeah. And everybody can be an expert in their own area. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, you, since you mentioned uh, insurance, you have in the past, or at least we've talked about um, injury incidents, things happening. Maybe that's mm-hmm. HR, maybe that's insurance, but do you have any processes or systems around that? Well, uh, one thing that, that yeah. 
A absolutely. One thing that we do, we, uh, we teach about early incident management. And all that means is that, that look, I'm not an insurance guy. I'm not, I'm not a workers' comp guy. All I can do is help preserve the information for the insurance. So, for example, if you have a bricklayer who's up on a scaffold and, and the scaffold falls apart and, and, and the bricklayer falls and breaks a leg, how do you document that so that you can, can create a file to, number one, protect the, the employee who's hurt, make sure you protect the property, uh, make sure you document what's happened so you can create a file to give to the insurance company if it comes up. You know, the, the worst thing in the world is, and, and, and that goes for back charges as well. So the worst thing in the world is to get to the end of a job and someone says, well, what about that damage you caused six months ago? And, and they say, well, what are you talking about? And they said, well, we, we have some records here that show that you, you caused this damage. And they have no idea what this, what they're talking about, or if they do, they have no way to protect themselves. And so, what we do is create a simple checklist or a form for them to fill out. So, if if someone falls off of some scaffolding, or or uh, someone runs into a a I don't know has a has a fender bender in the parking lot. Sure. What they what they do is simply just write down basic information: who, what, when, and where. Who was there? What happened? Um, and, and they, they, you know, first thing we tell them is make sure everyone's safe, make sure there's no more property damage, call 911, do whatever needs to be done, but then start documenting everything you can. Then when you get done, simply throw it in a file. And six months later, when they try to back charge you, you can say, no, no, wait a minute. Here are the pictures that, that we have. Here are the statements that we have and yeah. you can protect yourself. So again, it's just a basic system that you can put in to protect yourself. I'm mean, saying that documenting is a huge part of just systems in general, but also with that, I mean, you need to document um, or else you have no proof, I guess is the point there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you usually, okay. usually you don't even have any recollection. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. And, and, yeah. and you'd be, and you'd be surprised how many times a client is contacted by an insurance company a year and a half after an incident. And they didn't even know about it because the people at, at the office we're never told that that something happened on a job site. And then all of a sudden a lawyer calls and said, well, wait a minute, my client was hurt a year and a half ago and I've got to file a lawsuit now against you. And, and you have no idea uh, even what happened. And so you've got to, you, yeah. you've got to step up and, and take care of your business. Well, I think, I think that, um, you know, the, whenever you're, you've talked about this building a team a lot, building systems and, I think that for a lot of contractors, they just, you have to come into the realization that you're not going to be the expert at everything. You have to hire and, and trust other people um, and it's going to make you better. And then you've got to basically do the same thing for other people. What you're an expert at, create those systems for yourself to let other people do it. That's the only way that you're going to be what we've been calling the cash flow contractor, <laughs> have less stress, more time, more money. Um, you know, and, and Khalil, the, the beauty is that there's never been a time in history where there has been more opportunities for education. I mean, yeah. with technology, you can get online and you can get all kinds of, of education. You can get people who can help you build systems. I know that I've, uh, I've talked to Martin numerous times and, and he has helped a ton of uh, contractors build systems within their company and has helped educate them. And I just think that there's so many opportunities that there's not a reason why not to do it. I mean, there's yeah. just no reason not to do it because there, there's just too many opportunities of people out there to help you create systems and help you grow your business. Right. Well, I'm sure a lot of contractors, and I've even had this thought in the past as a business owner, uh, but they say, you know what, I can't afford an attorney right now. Um, but I'm sure your response to that is you can't afford not to have an attorney right now. <laughs> Um, so well, I, I, what, I just, I, I just think about that Fram commercial. You can pay me now or you can pay me it, later. Right. Right. It's exactly right. So what, I mean, if I'm a contractor, I'm, I'm a subcontractor and I am pretty small. I'm, I'm not sure that I can afford an attorney. How much should I try to budget for an attorney to get started? Even if it's on the smallest basis to start. Well, I, you know, to a certain extent, you can give that's, me a range. Yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's, that's a difficult question to answer, but I think it's a great question because I think every time that you go in and visit with a lawyer, 
you should have a conversation with that lawyer about how much do you charge an hour? Uh, with this fact pattern, what do you anticipate would be a budget for it? Now, yeah. a lawyer a lawyer can't guarantee results, and, and oftentimes, unless he's a flat fee attorney, can't guarantee how much time a certain issue can, can last or take to get resolved. But those are fair questions, and, and I think that, that, that clients, uh, contractors, business people, owners, investors, they should be good consumers as well. And I think one of the things they, that they should always do is question that lawyer about what your what your credentials. Do you have any experience in this area? Uh, do, you know, how many cases have you tried? How long have you been practicing? Do you have any bar complaints against you? Um, what do you think the the budget will be on this matter? How much do you charge per hour? These are all very valid questions, and I think that they should be asked on that first initial consultation. You so know, what's that was what's a, really, a go ahead. What's I mean, if, if we're going to ask those questions, what what should what should you look for in a good construction attorney? What are the you know key things that you're like, OK, that's that's good or no, that's not good. Like I'm assuming if they have no cases uh, on that kind of matter that you're looking yeah. into, probably not a best hire. Well, you, you know, and, and like I said before, construction cases come in all sizes and shapes. But I think I think the key is to find a lawyer who has some experience and has some knowledge about basic construction. Now, gotcha. I, I, know, I, I know in Oklahoma City and Norman and, and, and surrounding areas and Tulsa, we've got a lot of great construction attorneys uh, who have knowledge about, about construction issues. So, for example, uh, there's a process called mediation. And if we get into a dispute with someone, a lot of times in our contracts, we'll say, well, we have to go to mediation before we go to a lawsuit, which simply means you go and sit down with a third party. It's not binding. And that, that third party facilitator tries to bring the parties together to get a resolution. So kind of like a kindergarten teacher with the two people when they're in That's fire. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. That's right. So, so whenever, whenever I look for a mediator, I try to find someone who has construction experience, who's tried construction defect cases, who's, uh, tried to foreclose a mechanic lien, who's filed mechanic liens. So I, I always try to find someone who has experience in the construction industry. And I think that's extremely important because, you know, practicing law is just like probably being a doctor. You have surgeons and you have internists, you have, you know, all kinds of different doctors that, that stay within their lane and they don't get out and, and do other things. Well, you have lawyers the same way. Yeah. You have lawyers who, who are estate planners. You have lawyers who are personal injury lawyers. You have, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of lawyers. So, so make sure you find a lawyer who has experience in construction or real right. estate. Just like you don't want to, you know, find a, a painting contractor and ask him to build you a house. That's exactly um, right. Yeah. You, you want to get with a GC for something like that. Right. Your right. Uh, questionnaire, uh, would that give any indication uh, of questions that they might ask an attorney when they walked in the questionnaire that, or the the form that you have on your website? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We, in fact, we've set out a bunch of questions that we can, that, that, that a, uh, a client can go in and ask his or her attorney these specific questions. And, 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 you know, if you, if you like the responses and that's a good indication that this may be the right lawyer for you, if you don't get the responses you want, then that's probably a sign that this is not the right one for you. So that's a, that's a really good place to start because that's free right on your site. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'll just a note, listeners, we'll put um, all of the links to everything in the show notes. So you can, you can look for it there if you, if you need to. Um, yeah. And <laughs> we definitely, uh, obviously, I think we didn't say this at the beginning and we'll have to, but this is not legal advice uh, as does disclaimer. So I don't know if you want to add to that, Eric, at all. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is certainly no uh, uh, legal advice. We're talking about, 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 uh, basic concepts in general. And, and, and I encourage anybody, uh, who has an issue to, uh, go talk to a lawyer and, and, and don't assume anything that you hear on any broadcast is directed towards your specific issue, because every case is, uh, is different. And, and that lawyer needs to apply the facts to the case of that particular uh, situation 
So anything we're talking about today are, are just in general uh, educational information. Awesome. Well, um, I'm excited for this next uh, segment here. <laughs> what would that be? I hope I used the, I hope that was the right music there, but um, yeah, we're doing Mount Rushmore for uh, top four of a certain topic. And then we're actually gonna do it a little bit different today. So we're going to be sharing lawyer jokes <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think it's really, it, this will be funny. Um, so, so, so after you give the jokes, can I be the judge? You are the, you're judge. the judge. You get to choose okay, the George good. Washington, the top yeah. joke. And actually we're only going to share four. I'm sharing two, Martin sharing two, and um, you get to choose the best one. And I think, I think mine are pretty good, but I know Martin's <laughs> a good, a good joke teller. So, so who's going um, first? Here? Maybe we'll, I'll go first okay. and we'll do like back and forth. I won't go. Okay. You're doing one and I'll do one. one. Okay. Yeah. I hope I don't butcher this. <laughs> um, all right, Eric. So, What's do you know what the difference is between a bad lawyer and a good lawyer? What a bad lawyer may take several years to wrap up a case, a good lawyer will take even longer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's insulting! <laughs> uh, okay, so a guy walks into a law office and asks the attorney, he says, How much to answer three questions? The attorney says, 500 bucks. He says, that's kind of high, isn't it? He says, yeah. What's your third question? <laughs> that's good. Oh, okay, you're, neck good. And, you're, you're neck and neck right now. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. What, uh, what never works when it's fixed? What? A jury. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, there are a lot. There are a lot of ratios <laughs> out there. We're keeping this pretty quick. So, <laughs> we are. An attorney sitting in the uh, interrogation room down at the police department, and the cops are standing there looking at him. He says, I'm not talking without my lawyer present. He said, well, you are a lawyer. He says, exactly. Where's my present? <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom. That's a really Those are really benign. Now, here's a yeah. $100 bill. Uh, Eric, which one was the best? <laughs> oh gosh, they, they, they were they were all perfect. Um, gosh, that, that's a tough one, Martin. I'm going to have to probably give it to Khalil on the jury one. Oh, <laughs> oh. okay, we got it. I there didn't go get that one. <laughs> they, you did it. They no, were they, they were all winners, but that one probably came to the top. There we go. Good stuff. Okay. Um, man, I think that might have been the shortest Mount Rushmore segment we've done so far. <laughs> yeah. Martin. Um, okay. So I, I think this is the right sound effect here. <laughs> so um, I need to get some new sounds too. So quote of the day, Eric, we're going to give that one to you today. What is our quote for this episode? You know, this is a quote that I've uh, lived by for years and it's, and it's, and it's really impacted the direction I've taken my practice, but the quote that I've always relied on is knowledge is power. And I think that the more knowledge that you can get is, is only uh, going to make your life better. And, and, and it's going to improve your business. It's going to improve your personal life. It's going to improve your relationships. So the more knowledge you can get out there about the world, about your business, about your family, it's going to, it's good. It's just going to improve everything. So to me, knowledge is power. I like that. I think, man, when you start taking the approach of knowledge is power or never stop learning, um, you know, I, I guess if you're probably listening to this episode that you already have that mentality because you're seeking this stuff out, but man, it, it really does change things. It changes your perspective on the world, gives you more humility because you realize how little, you know, and, I mean, you, it just changes how your perspective on the world and um, you just have to keep on learning. And then I think with that, understand that you're not going to be the expert in everything um, and take on the approach of asking questions to other people that are experts and trying to learn from them. Um, so I, I agree it's power and it's um, it's the best way to live. I agree. Yeah. First level uh, of knowledge is to know that you don't know. Boom, boom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. Yeah. 
That's exactly yeah. right. And admitting that you don't know, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, is a lot of the, I mean, we just talked about the systems and, and having those trusted advisors. I mean, that's really where it starts. Otherwise you're just thinking that you're the, you're the expert in everything and you're just going to keep going and nothing bad's going to happen. You're doing it the best way possible. Mm-hmm. It's just not true. Well, and, and, and you really have two choices in life. You have the choice of doing nothing or you have the choice of doing something. And, and I think that the choice of doing nothing is a risky way to live. You, you should always move forward. And just like I think Martin just said, you should always question, ask questions, seek answers. And I think that, uh, that that's the path I choose. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, well, really the neat thing about Eric and what happened today was what, I, what I'm really hearing. Was, and Ethan, I'm not taking away from you. We're going to see what you heard. But to get a checklist on mechanic cleans, to get a checklist to just look at and get a first read on contracts, to get a checklist for incidents, that's something and to download your form so that you can get an idea of where you are. You don't have to be a lawyer to do all those things. That is knowledge that that points you in the right direction. Uh, that can, I mean, here's a piece of knowledge. Oops, it's 91 days since I quit working on that job. <laughs> I am no longer eligible to file a lien. Oops, yep. there's there's where power and knowledge meet. <laughs> yep. Well. I, and I think that's a great point. And you kind of listed it out there, some things that we can do, but like, you know, contractor, Eric, who has none of this stuff in place, what's something they should go do right now? Like really clear steps, one, two, three, whatever. What do they need to do? Well, I, I think the first thing is is to is to acknowledge the fact that, that you may have some weaknesses in your business. Because I, I, I think the first thing is just to, is just to acknowledge that. And, and it gets back to this knowledge is power. You can do not something or do nothing. If you continue to do nothing, then it, it, nothing's going to change. But if you, if you make that decision that you're going to start seeking answers, that's the first step. And then once you make that decision to seek answers, then reach out and start talking to some trusted advisors. Uh, I, I called Martin yesterday uh, for some advice. I mean, you, you, you reach out to people who, who have some knowledge about something. And, and believe me, there's a lot of good people out there that want to help you succeed. And so, so the first step is to acknowledge that you don't know everything and that you may have some areas that you could improve. Number two, start reaching out to people and, and whether they're trusted advisors, uh, you're, I'm sure you already have an insurance agent. Go, go sit down and have lunch with that insurance agent and say, what do I not know? Uh, uh, what gaps are in my insurance policy that I may not know about? Go talk to your banker and say, do I have my financing in place the best way that I could have it? What could I do different to improve? And where can I, and where can I find out more about what I'm doing? Uh, call your lawyer and say, you know, here, here's some risks that I think that I have in my, in my company. Um, what can you do to help me evaluate and come up with a plan to fix that? So, so uh, reaching out to trusted advisors, I think, is is the next step. And then yeah. the third, and then the third step is to when they give you that advice, follow through with it. I mean, they want you to succeed, <laughs> and and there's so many resources out there that they can point you to. Most of them are free. I mean, yeah. you know, there's so many opportunities out there to to get educated about. About anything, um, it's to the point now that that I'll give you an example. Whenever I, I can't do something, I had to repair my lawnmower the other day, and my 26 year old son said, "Dad, just look it up on YouTube." And sure enough, I got on YouTube, <laughs> typed it in, and it showed me how to do it, and I was able to fix my lawnmower. So, so there's there's information out there on everything you want to learn. So that yeah. the, those are probably the three things that I would recommend. Well, I know well, where I, a free one is too, right? <laughs> your form on your on your yeah. On I your think that mechanically system survey is probably. I mean, I've seen it. It's great. It's really comprehensive and really easy. You just answer yes or no, yes or no, and then, and not sure. I guess is another option. Yeah. But whatever you said no or not sure to, you work on those things and That's you take right. it to a lawyer that you work on. Um, yeah, and it's and, not, and, it's not and, rocket and, science. And at our website, we have a, have a, uh, some, some little boxes you can fill in, and we'll send you a newsletter, and we'll 
we'll send you all the information that we have and, and, and it's an ongoing thing, uh, uh, that we send out. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for, for some, some great knowledge that you can get for free. So I encourage everyone to go over and take a look at it. That's great. So Martin, you had a question that almost ruined this entire episode. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. But you were curious how it worked how out. That, that how contract. did that story work out? Yeah. Where but, you, uh, COVID uh, shut you down. Well, and the pandemic hit. And so, so Eric, what was, that? maybe give a refresher because it's been a, what, an hour almost since, yeah. uh, you told that story. <clears throat> that. Well, the main thing I want you to remember about that story is this was the perfect job. Everything went right. You know, it, it's easy to to make judgments about things when they go wrong and say, well, am I protected? Did I do everything right? It's more difficult when you have a perfect job and everything goes perfect. Nothing goes wrong. You don't anticipate anything to go wrong. And in this case, we got down after this perfect job and, and my client was ready to get paid and they didn't get paid. Luckily, um, we had been working with this client and we were able to set up a system, a mechanic lien system, and he was able to determine that his work was lienable. He was able to determine that uh, uh, the correct information, when the last day of work was, uh, uh, the legal description, the property owner's name, and that he was able to, to uh, prepare the correct forms. And we were able to follow the, um, unfortunately, I had, we had to follow mechanic lien. And, um, and my guess is that the, that the owner realized that, that we were going to get paid. And, and so they went ahead and wrote a check and, so we had a good result. Uh, uh, the client was still happy. They had a great, beautiful job done, and and my client was paid. And I think it was all primarily because he had a system in place where he could enforce his rights, which are these are rights given by the state of Oklahoma to my client. So so that was a good result in this situation, simply because of, of the lien that he had been working on for for some quite uh, for a, for a bit of time now. I think, uh, I think something that you left out there, um, it's, I mean, you guys had everything in place so quickly and were able to get it filed so fast. You got to the front of the line, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in, in because explain how that works. Like, you know, cause they can have multiple people file liens against it. Right. Well, whenever, yeah. I mean, it, most of the time and when it comes to liens, mortgages and that sort of thing, it's a race to the courthouse and the first one that gets there and files it has priority over everyone else. It's a little bit different when you have subcontractors, they all share pro rata uh, based on the work. But if you have a mortgage in front of you, it's important to get that lien on file quickly. Uh, the good news is that liens relate back to the first day of work, so you don't have to worry about that. It's just you, the key is to make sure you get it filed timely within the, the time limits that uh, the statutes require. So the good news is that that we were uh, able to, to pull out the system and, and work it. And, and luckily my client was paid. And, and like I said, it, it was a substantial amount and had my client not been paid that amount, it would have really impacted his business. And like I said, 99% of the time, everything's going to go right in, in business. It's just that one time that you have to be prepared for. Wiped out. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, um, it's that time. I think I've got some new music today. We'll see how this sounds. But uh, it's Intern Insights with Ethan. You ready, Ethan? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're going to put one minute on. We got some music to give you some little anticipation now. So we'll see how this goes. Um, Ooh, okay. Can you hear it? <laughs> I can hear that. Okay. Well, um, yeah, let's go for it. Timer's on the clock. Give us a recap oh, of everything that's happened. I'm going with the music. Okay, well, you're going with the music. Eric helps people avoid getting sued and not getting paid before it happens. Uh, he does this by teaching them systems. Uh, one of the biggest problems he sees is people don't have systems in place uh, because they don't think anything is going to go wrong. But right when something, right when they don't think something goes wrong, it goes wrong. Uh, you can't just focus on your craft. You have to have systems in place that will protect you, and you have to have teams too, like accountants and lawyers and uh, business coaches. Uh, yeah. Document your systems uh, and take the interpretation and personality out of your systems. Um, never redline a contract. Use an addendum to negotiate a more fair contract or a win-win. Um, a mechanic lien is a superpower uh, for contractors, subcontractors, 
and suppliers. And I think the biggest thing was just document everything, uh, write everything down, video everything, and your systems and everything. And yeah. Okay. You know, the that intern said right in about... 45 seconds what it took us 40, uh, an hour to say. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. You take the only good thing notes, I'm upset you? about. We, we finally got business coach in there. We didn't get marketer in there. We didn't get uh, anybody to help with that. <laughs> Ethan could have well, added hey, that to the recap. Up, Eric to could you. have added it earlier in the episode. No shout out to me. <laughs> no, I'm marketing, just marketing is an important part of it. Believe yep. me. Yeah. You got to have customers. You're going to go out of business. That's right. <laughs> hey, we just rely okay. on word of mouth. In other words, everything yeah. that happens to us is an accident. <laughs> That's a good point. Well, Great first interview. I think that's a great way to kick off our interviews for the cash flow contractor. Definitely helpful for contractors. I think this can bring a lot of clarity, get stress off their mind. Um, but like you said, help them have more money um, and less risk. And um, yeah, more more time if they can get those systems in place as well. You know, I'm uh, Eric. How can? Oh, go ahead, Martin. Well, I'm speaking for Eric, but I know Eric well enough that. If listeners want to shoot us some questions, we'd maybe like to have you on again um, without yeah, diving absolutely. so far as to practicing law on a podcast, well, but more refined questions. Um, because yeah, yeah, any, yeah, anytime people have any questions, I'd love to come back and talk about them. And, and uh, uh, that's always a good time. Yeah. yeah where, where can people uh, contact you? Uh, the, our website is www.daffernlawfirm.com. How do you spell Daffern? Okay. It's D A F F E R N lawfirm.com. Okay. Okay. And that's where we'll put a link to that in the show notes. We'll have um, the mechanic lean survey in there as well. And uh, yeah, we'd love to have you back and really appreciate your time, Eric. Great. I appreciate y'all having me on. Okay. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Cash Flow Contractor. Check out our website in the show notes or visit thecashflowcontractor.com. What's up, Cashflow Contractors? Khalil here. Thank you so much for getting to the end of this episode. It means the world to us that you're listening. Uh, I've got a favor to ask. So we are looking for contractors who would like to have a consult, a free consult with myself and with Martin um, for about 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, we'll basically just ask you questions about your business, about what it's like for you to work as a contractor, and then we will answer any of your questions specific to your business. Then we'll make that a live episode for other contractors to learn from, to engage with, uh, and we think it's a great way for people to really see clear, uh, specific answers to problems that contractors have. So if that interests you at all, we're not going to share any of your information. Um, we, you don't even need to say your name on the episode, but I think we want to get some more of these episodes out there. And if you're willing to do that, we've got a link in the show notes that allows you to just submit a form for a consult. Then we'll schedule it with you and record it and we'll put you live on, on uh, the podcast. So if that interests you, please check it out in the show notes. If not, no worries. Or if you know someone else that you think would be interested in it, send it to them. That'd be great but appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, we hope that you're finding less stress, more time and more money. Thanks.